Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Visualizing and Tracking Extracellular Vesicles Delivery and RNA Translation by Dr. Charles Lai. I am Dr. Chad Schwartz, Senior Application Scientist at Beckman Coulter, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational webinar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter is a leader in centrifugation and flow cytometry and has long been an innovator in particle characterization, lab automation, and genomics. Beck and Coulter products are used at the forefront of important areas of investigation and discovery. For more information, please visit BeckmanCoulter.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem to the green Q&A button. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Charles Lai. Dr. Lai received his Bachelor's of Science in 2003 and PhD in 2010 from the University of British Columbia, Canada, where he studied the role of gap junctions and its analogs, panexins and glioma, under the, profe under the guidance of Professor Christian Naus. In 2010, he joined Professor Zandra Brakefield and Bacos Tanus Laboratories in Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School as a postdoctoral fellow, fellow, and later in 2014 as an instructor to expand his research horizon in cell-to-cell -cell communication, centering on extracellular vesicle-mediated communication between glioma and glioma stromal cells. He developed one of the first non-invasive methods to monitor EVs in cargo in vitro and in vivo. In 2015, Dr. Lai joined National Tsinghua University as an assistant professor of the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. I am pleased to now turn it over to Dr. Charles Lai for his presentation. Hi everyone, um, this is Charles, and thank you Chad for the kind introduction as well as Beckman Coulter for the invitation to allow me to share our work with you today. So again, this is my title for today, which is Visualization and Tracking of Extracellular Vesicle Delivery and RNA Translation Using Multiplex Reporters. So as an icebreaker, so this would be my first slide. Um, most of the work actually has been done in Boston. And as you can see, we have one of the toughest storms this year that um, the snow piles so hard that uh, it's almost as tall as um, an individual. In any case, again, the work had been done at Harvard Medical School, as you can see on the left. This is what we call the quad. And also at Mass General Hospital, under the guidance of Dr. Sandra Brickhill, as well as Buckus Tenus. Now, after the harsh winter, we have fate or chance that uh, I recently uh, moved to National Tsinghua University in Xinchu, Taiwan, to begin my assistant professorship. And as you can see, it's a very vibrant uh, campus with uh, lots of young students, as well as a nice scenery, because we're just right by the mountain. And not only that, we actually have uh, a nuclear reactor, as you can see on the top right of the picture right here. So that's really kind of unique. And we have a very strong team of uh, professors currently working on biomedical research, which I'll discuss briefly towards the end of this talk. Now, um, to begin our talk, which is on extracellular vesicles, since I pretty much grew up in Canada, so I will use a quote from a radio station from Canada, which is a Canadian broadcast company, CBC Radio, and they have a quote for their program called the Final Cafe. And the quote is such that we may not be big, but we are small. And I thought this quote describes extracellular vesicles quite well, that they are tiny, but they actually do a lot of things. So let's head into it. What are extracellular vesicles? So as you can see on the left right here, here is an image of the cells releasing little dots which later people realize are extracellular vesicles. And on the right, as you can see right here, are key in pictures showing you extracellular vesicles exhibiting the uh, double membrane structure. And there are various type or populations of extracellular vesicles, which will use the word EB in general, that the smaller kind that people categorize them as are called exosomes. They have a diameter ranging from 40 to 100 nanometers. Coming up are the shed microvesicles, which Typical consensus are ranging from 100 to 1,000 nanometer diameter, and also the ectopic flaps where dying cells actually release them. They can be as big as up to 4,000 nanometers in diameters. Not only that, um, 
the DCOs group recently, or in the past couple of years, have been finding that cancer cells actually release really, really big vesicles that they now term as oncosomes. They also carry a role for cell-to-cell -cell communication uh, by the vesicles. So how do they exactly communicate with one another by using this uh, moiety? So in essence, as uh, a schematic diagram to show you on the left right here, we have the donor cells. So what happens is that these donor cells can actually release vesicles either through fusion of the microvesicular body to release the little vesicle, which will be termed exosomes, or the budding of the vesicles from the membrane. Then later scientists actually realized that they carry a lot of cargo, including proteins, DNA, as well as RNA. And when these vesicles reaches their recipient cells, they can actually offload these cargos and thereby affecting the recipient cells either through direct protein or ligand to receptor interaction, or more so in recent findings, they found that the vesicles actually carry a lot of microRNA to manipulate the gene expression. So how about vesicles relevance to diseases? So a lot of people have been finding that vesicle, albeit very tiny and small, as you can see right here, they have a lot of relevance to many types of disease, including cancer, neurological disease, such as uh, Alzheimer that has been actively researched on, and as well as Parkinson's, and also heart disease, that people found that um, cardiovascular disease tends to release a lot of vesicles, as well as uh, autoimmune disease. That's what people are looking currently into right now. And also people have found that vesicles can actually prime infection um, by various sources. But I think the hottest topic nowadays is that um, people tend to use vesicle as a means for diagnosis. So they're using, um, or at least they're looking into biomarkers on the vesicles and thereby allowing non-invasive uh, diagnosis of the patients. And in terms of publication, if you look at this chart that uh, I grabbed just a few days ago, that you can see that for, if you use the term exosome and type into PubMed, or if you use the term microvesicles, you can see that basically the publication has jumped exponentially from around 2008 all the way to 2014. And I believe the uh, publication number is still going up quite drastically. So it is a very um, highly pursued field right now because it basically expanded our thinking of cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication. As Chad mentioned earlier, my previous work is on uh, gap junction mediated intercellular communication. What that means is that the two cells have to come in contact with one another in order to form gap junction, their physical conduit, to pass on the molecules that they want to communicate with one another. However, for vesicles, they're like a wireless network. They no longer need to touch one another. All they have to do is release these vesicles, which carry a lot of message as well as protein, and when once delivered to the recipient cells, they can elicit phenotypic changes. And those are what made the extracellular vesicles so exciting as well as expanding our horizon in understanding how cells actually communicate with one another. Now, jumping a little bit further is, if people can actually study the etiology of disease based on, or at least contributed by EV, can we actually reversely employ them or engineer them for therapy? And so the first part that people are actually looking into is if they can use EV as a means for immunotherapy, basically by using them as, uh, very superficially speaking, they're trying to use them as a way to present the antigens to the immune system, such as uh, the Judic cell or natural killer T cells, those kind of things so that they can elicit um, immune activation against uh, disease such as cancer. Now, for another way um, that people have been trying to do is to package RNAi or um, other gene therapeutic cargo into the vesicles. And then not only that, uh, many groups are already decorating the outside of the uh, vesicles with uh, targeting proteins, such as in this case from Matthew Wu's group, that they use a reduced lipoprotein to tar target the silicone receptor neurons in the brain. And they have been doing that quite successfully in their um, paper back in 2012, I believe. And last but not least, people have been doing um, drug packaging into the vesicles as a way to deliver their therapeutic cargo. Now, people may ask why uh, people choose to do vesicle. So one theory of thought is that vesicle, since they're actually produced by the cells, they will actually elicit um, much less immunogenic response in comparison to their uh, artificial analogs, such as uh, liposomes. So that's why people are actually looking into um, vesicle as a therapeutic vehicle that's actually um, produced endogenously by the body itself. 
Now, um, taking a gear backwards, so we're going to stop a little bit. A lot of people are trying to study vesicles, but if you look at the previous literatures, a lot of them use, had to use dyes because they had no other means of looking at this um, nanometer-sized vesicles. So what they usually resort to is something such as the um, PKH dyes that you can see right here, that's produced by Sigma Eldridge. Now, if you look at the vesicles, um, actually, if you look at the instructions of the uh, manufacturer quite carefully, you realize that they actually do honestly report that the half-life of these dyes basically are aliphatic chains that can insert into the membranes. They can last as long as 100 days, for example, for this PKH26. Now, the question that I'd like to pose is that if, if you actually label your vesicles, and then if you look into either in vitro or in vivo, the question comes up as to after a certain amount of time, are you still looking at your vesicles, or are you looking at the remnants of, remnants of the dyes after the vesicle has been degraded? So that's been something that um, worried me a lot when I started uh, working on extracellular vesicles. And not only that, there are other dyes such as uh, lipophilic dyes, such as dye I. Um, those are things that had always been in our mind when we were trying to visualize them, because without seeing them, it is really hard to convince us that vesicles really actually work uh, in a very dynamic way. Now, there are other problems such that if you actually use the dyes to label your vesicles, you may have dye residues, which you must do a lot of washing steps in order to rid um, of this uh, non-specific button. But not only that, when you do the uh, washing, you lose a lot of your vesicles. So those are a lot of problems that we're trying to overcome. Now, just to go over briefly about how people actually detect vesicles for their study, so we have the conventional microscopy techniques such as you know, SEM, PEM, as well as atomic force microscopy. And not only that, a lot of uh, pioneers actually use um, exosomal specific markers such as CD63 conjugated to GFP, or in Dr. Uh, Stephen Booth's group, that they actually use uh, ASOPYA GFP to label vesicles. And as well, people use immunolabeling techniques such as antibody against uh, CD63 or CD81. Uh, to label their vesicles, and as we have discussed earlier, uh, people use a lot of dyes to see the vesicles in order to track them. But the question comes as to, there may be more than other, uh, there may be other, other protein other than CD63 that labels the vesicles. So this really opens up um, a lot of questions in our mind as to, is there a way that we can actually effectively see the vesicles uh, in a more, or a more broader uh, population? And then as well as um, a more, precise uh, labeling uh, that gives us a better spatial control resolution. So we went out to set up a couple criteria uh, when we were designing uh, the experiment. So first of all, as, as I mentioned, is to have um, ensure really high EV labeling specificity and also accuracy in terms of the uh, spatial as well as the temporal resolution so that we won't be um, confounded by the possible artifacts of um, the long half-life of the dyes. And also resolution. So since people are trying to track these nanometer size vesicles, we really have two aims. The first one is actually to see, once we put it into the animals, can we actually track them inside a whole animal? Another one is subcellular resolution, because their nanometer size, is it possible that we can actually track them in such a way that we can see which organelle or how they actually enter the vesicles, oh, sorry, in the cells? So those are the goals that we set up to do. Now, for the first part of the talk, I'll go over our earlier study where we actually devised a way to try to understand uh, how vesicle actually travel about in the body. And as I described earlier, many people are trying to use vesicle as a therapy. So you can see that most people actually are quite familiar with intravenous injection um, of any drug. So that's something that we're interested in. But we're also interested in intranasal injection of the vesicles because that will allow you to bypass the blood and barrier quite directly and goes into the brain. And some goals for doing this study is that we are trying to, again, image them in the whole animal. And not only that, we would like to do biodistribution as well as blood and urine uh, clearance once you actually put the vesicle into uh, the body. Because these are very important special temporal characteristics that we need to define before we consider further of using vesicle as a therapeutic vehicle. So for this talk, we'll focus primarily on the intravenous administration route. So how do we achieve that? Vesicles are so tiny. How do we label them effectively? So we went, and under the collaboration with uh, Dr. Buckles Tanus, we actually used calcium luciferase, which is a marine copoplase you can see right here, that 
they are very unique in such that they have a flash type fluorescence, sorry, bioluminescence that's a thousand times more sensitive than the typical firefly as well as renewal luciferase. And then the other th this thing is that unlike effluent or firefly luciferase, Gaussian luciferase does not require APP. Now this gives us a lot of advantage over uh, effluent because we, we're not dependent on APP anymore. And not only that, GBOOC is actually quite pH resistant, meaning that they can actually work quite well in different environmental conditions. And as you can see on the bottom, which is the uh, reaction of this uh, substrate, once we use a substrate, cilantrozin in this case, and then when we add GBOOC and it only requires oxygen, then the reaction, as you can see on the right, is a very high intensity light that comes out around 400 nan nanometers. So this really allows us to uh, pave um, a way to develop the reporters. So how do we actually target them onto the vesicle or label the vesicles? So what we did is right here that we use a two model, um, actually a two parts reporter system. Now for the top part right here, what we did right here is that we have a humanized Gaussian luciferase juke and then we conjugated them to a transmembrane domain of the PDGF receptor. And between them, we actually have a biotin receptor protein. What this allows us to do is that once expressed in the donor cells of the vesicle, in this case, we tested with HEK293 T cells. And you can see that the transmembrane domain right here will allow the protein to be anchored onto the plasma membrane. And then the GBOOC region will be exposed on the outside. Now, second part of this reporter is the SSHBRA, which is the biotin ligase. What this allows us to do is that once co-expressed in the receptor, I'm sorry, in the donor cells, we can actually have the biotin receptor protein, as indicated right here, to be biotinylated. Once it's biotinylated, it actually provides us a multimodal imaging platform because we can actually conjugate many different imaging um, agents uh, that's uh, conjugated to strep abdomen and then do other types of imaging analysis. And that's something that I, can, I will show um, in the bit of this talk right here. So once we actually express these reporters, then we'll isolate the vesicles and then we can inject into the animals by the intravenous injection. Then we can actually see where they go about. And this is in fact what we saw. So uh, first of all, we would like to characterize whether we successfully label the vesicles well. Now, on the top um, row right here, as you can see, we have the uh, GBOOC B, or the um, GBOOC membrane bound version, uh, which is actually conjugated and then expressed on the membrane of the vesicles. As you can see, this is the immunogo labeling of the uh, GBOOC. And then not only that, we actually confirmed that we successfully isolated vesicles or exosomes by using CD63 antibodies. And further, we actually use anti-biotin antibodies and prove that these vesicles can also be biotinylated. So by using this moiety, there are two things that we achieve is that we can actually get GBOOC onto the vesicles. And not only that, we have biotinylation occurring on the surface of the vesicles. And in comparison to our control right here, which is just a free form, free floating form of GBOOC, we don't see any type of labeling by the GBOOC. We still successfully confirm that we have CD63, which means we have exosomes. And but for the control, we don't have any biotinylation, meaning that the system is actually quite specific and clean. Now, we would like to test further. Now, we know that it labels the vesicles, but is the protein still active? Does it actually still retain its bioluminescence activity? So what we did right here is that we isolated the vesicles. So for this study, we'd like to clarify that what we did is that we did a 300, 300 G followed by 2000 G to rid of the cellular debris. Then we filter it with a 0.22 micron filter. Then we spawn them down with a 100,000 G spin to isolate our vesicles. Then we subjected them to sucrose gradient and we found that the vesicle um, activity for the bioluminescence actually showed quite well from fraction three all the way to fraction five. Whereas for our control, majority of the reaction or the activity for the bioluminescence is actually in the top fraction, which signifies the free folding bound uh, type of uh, GWOOP. Then we actually protein piloted them, and then we tested again. Again, the activity trend matches the one that we saw on the top for the, um, the sucrose gradient. And then for the control right here, we can see that this trend basically follows residues 
of uh, G-loop protein that's not bound to anything. Then we did Western blot analysis to confirm that we actually do have, again, the biotin labeling onto the membranes, which actually reflects with uh, the results that we saw on the top. So basically, fraction 3, 4, 5, 6 have biotin as well as uh, G-loop uh, protein exposure. And then we further use ALIX as another exosomal marker to confirm that we have a successful uh, vesicle isolation for our Western blot analysis. And in comparison, we don't see much of the labeling of biotin and very, very little amount of G-loop, which we suspect is just a little bit of free bound of G-loop that um, gets into the vesicles just by random chance. No. So now we have confirmed that the vesicles that we created can actually have both bioluminescence as well as uh, multimodal imaging platforms. So we went on to see if it's possible to actually image them in vivo. So here's what we did again. We isolated vesicles, we injected them into the animals through the intravenous vein. Then right away, we, at different times, we inject them through um, the retro orbital vein with uh, their substrate, cilantrozine, for bioluminescence imaging. And this is what we saw. By using the IVIS, or in vivo imaging system, what we saw is half an hour after the IV injection, you can actually see right away that the backside or the dorsal side of the mice um, coming up with a lot of signals on the left, which signifies the spleen. Now, for our control, the PBS, you actually don't see much signal at all. And then when you flip them over right away, we can actually see, again, the spleen coming up and also liver. And then on the right right here is our um, X, X, sorry, X FIFO analysis, where we actually extract the organs, homogenize them, and test their bioluminescence. We basically found similar finding that liver as well as the spleen had the most activity, whereas the control just carries the typical background amount of bioluminescence that we have seen, as well as previously reported. Now, we previously mentioned about the capability of multimodal imaging, so we went on to test this by using fluorescent mediated tomography, or FMT. And again, what we did right here is that we conjugated the vesicles that we isolated with Alexa 687, and then afterwards we injected into the animals through the intravenous vein. Half an hour later, then we exposed them to FMT imaging. And as you can see on the left right here, again, the liver as well as the spleen started to shine up right away. And then on the right right here, it's basically 3D rendering of the images that we saw that, again, the liver and the spleen came up. Whereas the PBS control just showed the typical background uh, fluorescence that you would expect. So these are not enough to actually satisfy our um, desire to find exactly where they go about. So we decided to actually, unfortunately, have to sacrifice the mice at different time points after intravenous injection. So what we did here is at half an hour, one hour, and then at two hour, and all the way up to uh, 360 minutes, which is six hours, we actually isolated the organs and then homogenized them and then tested them for bioluminescence to detect the biodistribution of the vesicles over time. And what we found is actually very striking. As you can see on the top right here, now again, these animals, when sacrificed, are not perfused. So what we saw is that the spleen actually show up as one of the highest organ uh, exhibiting the signals. And this is followed by the liver, which is in blue, then the lung, which is in red right here, then as well as the kidneys. On the right right here, you'll realize the scale bar is quite different. They're much, much lower, which shows that Again, on the, on the right is the brain, the heart, and the muscles, showing you that we actually don't get much going into the brain as expected. And this is anticipated based on previous finding as well, that vesicles through intravenous injection doesn't go into the brain very well. And we don't see very much in the heart as well as the muscles in this case. Now, this actually brought another question to us, is that, okay, we see a lot of them going to the spleen as well as the liver, but which organs actually actively process them? So we decided to do another set of experiment, very similar one, but instead, after we sacrificed the mouse, we actually perfused the animals with PBS. So basically what we're trying to do here is, is to rid of the blood inside the organs. So if the vesicles are actively being processed by these organs, you would expect the signal to be somewhat retained. And this is what we saw. And very surprisingly, the spleen actually, which show one of the highest signal, became one of the lowest. This actually suggests to us that the spleen actually does not actively 
process the vesicles, but rather they may be a temporary reservoir for the vesicles to be stored before they are being processed by the other organs. And then if you look at the kidney, which is also very interesting, right here, they actually became one of the highest, whereas back on the top, in the non-perfused animals, they actually show one of the lowest. Now, this is something that we can go over when we go into the urine clearance, suggesting that a small percentage of the vesicles, we believe, actually do go through the kidneys. But if we look at the liver right here, as well as the lung, you can see that the trend is very much similar as the ones that we see on the top, which is here as well as here. Now I'm going to clear the arrows because it's getting a little bit too crowded. But basically you can see that both the liver and the lung did not change their distribution very much before and after perfusion, suggesting to us that these two organs are actually one of the primary organs processing the vesicles through IV uh, administration. And again, on the right, you can see that the distribution pattern for the brain, the heart, and the muscles are still on the very low side, meaning that not much vesicles actually gets delivered to them uh, right away. Now, we want to prove that what we saw in the kidney is actually true. So again, coming back to this slide right here, remember that the kidney used to be one of the lowest, and now that they are one of the highest. So we decided to take the perfused kidney and then did uh, immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry basically. Now on the top right here, top row right here, you can see we have the GB, which is all experimental, that once we injected them, we harvested the vesicle, sorry, we harvested the kidney and we did the cryo sessioning and did immunofluorescence. And you can see that where the arrow is pointing at right now, you can see magenta-like color showing you vesicles are being located by using the um, NTG root antibody. Whereas if we use the vesicle that's not being labeled by G with B, which is our control right here, you cannot see much of the vesicles actually going to here, just to show you that the fluorescence labeling is really quite specific. So this tells us that once the animal has been perfused, a lot of them actually gets pushed to the kidney. Now, we're very perplexed as to how this might have happened. So we went on to test the blood and urine clearance. So I'll go over the urine clearance uh, first. What we did is that, again, very similar experiment at similar time points, half an hour, one hour, three hour, three hour, even up to six hours, we look at them and see, we collected the urines and trying to see how much bioluminescence of activity are being observed. And we found that it's very, very unique that it starts at very low, at half an hour right after injection, then it jumps up to one of the highest peak around an hour after injection, and this is followed by a decline from 90 minutes and on all the way to three hours. So these suggest to us that the vesicle, even though a very, very small percentage, because if you look at the scale bar here, we're talking about around 0.001% of the initial dose, are actually been clear through the urine. However, we actually did another test where we actually just injected the G root, which is a free uh, floating protein. The pattern is actually drastically different. The, the pattern is such that the signal would be the highest on the top, and then followed by exponential decay, and then all the way to the bottom uh, over time. So this provided us um, an indirect evidence that the vesicles are being actually cleared through the kidney. And not only that, it goes back quite well with what we observed in the profuse kidneys, such that once you actually sacrifice the animal, and then since they cannot pee anymore, you profuse the kidney, so all the vesicles are being pushed to the kidney and they do not get released. And this would suggest to us the reason why that there is so much um, vesicle signal being found in the kidneys. Now coming back to the blood, as you can see right here on the left, we can see that the blood is interesting. They actually go through, the vesicle actually goes through a bimodal decay. So first of all, they will go through a very quick decay phase, which lasts for about 20 minutes. Then they will enter a second decay phase, which lasts for um, around 200 minutes. So this makes sense because the fast decay in the first phase basically allows them to distribute to the different organs that you saw from our studies uh, with the uh, biodistribution. And then for the latter part of the decay, which is about 200 minutes in terms of this half-life, is the part where the organ starts to process them. And this actually matches really well with what we found uh, with the organ studies. Now, with these, uh, we are really, really surprised that this is how fast the vesicles gets clear because previous study before 
ours, we're suggesting that the vesicles can actually be stuck inside um, the animals up to 24 or 48 hours by using dye labeled vesicles. And what we found here is that a lot of vesicle actually gets cleared, basically within six hours or slightly longer. Now, the next stage that we would like to test is that, okay, a lot of them are trying to use vesicle to um, cure tumor. Is it possible that we can actually localize or deliver vesicle to tumor? So this is a proof of principle study. So what we did right here is that we had the tumors, um, in this case, it's just a glioma tumor uh, that's expressing entry. So as you can see, we implant the tumors to the chest uh, area of the mice. So both on the left and the right chest in three different subjects. So one, two, and three. And then you can see that by using IDIS imaging system, we can see the tumor formation quite well. But once we inject them with the GBP vesicles, you can see that the signal actually came up to the tumor area as well for both subject one, two, and three. And not only that, uh, after the imaging, we actually did um, ex vivo, so organ uh, analysis. We can see that the amount in the tumors are actually comparable to the ones in the spleen and the liver. So this suggests that the vesicles do get delivered to the tumors quite well. And we're, we're speculating that this could be due to the leaky vesicle of the tumors, which are quite commonly seen in many types of tumors. And that's why the vesicles can go to them quite readily. So with these, we proved that the vesicles can actually be imaged uh, with a whole animal uh, resolution. And we actually found that the distribution phase of the vesicle is actually quite dynamic, that such that from half an hour to one hour post-injection, they actually go to the spleen followed by the liver and the lung, and then the rest of the organs. And then from through the elimination phase, we actually see from one hour to six hours, um, they actually starts to get degraded and processed. Primarily, we believe, through the hepatic, but since we see a very little amount of them coming out from the urine and then through the uh, kidney, we believe that a very small amount actually do come out from the uh, renal pathway. Now, um, and we also showed that they actually localize the tumor as a principal experiment. So we have just gone through the whole animal imaging homology that we developed. So the next step is to see if we can actually overcome the um, whole animal resolution. So if we can look further and deeper into the subcellular compartment of the cells. So this is how we actually did it. And to be honest, we do not want to reinvent the wheel because the technique is much there. It just had not been used. So what we did right here is that we actually simply conjugated uh, homophilation moiety at the end terminus of uh, two fluorescent protein because we would like to do more than one color. So the first one is GFP that we're familiar with. But on the other hand, we also con conjugated them or labeled, uh, tagged them uh, with TD tomato. So what this allows us to do is actually very interesting. It's because that they actually allows these fluorescent proteins to be inserted into the inner leaflet of the lipid bilayer. Now, the reason why I mentioned about inner leaflet uh, is quite important, which I'll mention later on. But at the bottom right here, is something that you'll see is that here is, again, our HGK293 T cells stably expressing what we call, again, homotolated GFP. You can see the cells actually are completely covered with the GFP. And if you look closer, you can see that a lot of vesicle-like structures are being released or budded either around on the cells or around the periphery of the cells. So this is really quite exciting. So this is being imaged by uh, live cell confocal microscopy. And I have to tell you that when you do live cell imaging, you actually get to preserve the structure really well. And this is something that you cannot regularly achieve with pig cells. So by doing this, this really allows to monitor how the vesicles are being released. And then not only that, you can actually do them through time-lapse imaging to have an understanding of their temporal resolution. So moving on, we'd like to do some characterization. Even though we see them being released, you know, and looking like budding off from the cells, we'd like to see if they actually label those vesicles quite well. So what we did right here is we have two cell lines. One is, again, 1083 p with palm GFP, and the other one is palm TD tomato. Then we actually isolate the vesicle. In this study, we actually isolate them by similarly 300G followed by 2000G, but in this case, we use a 0.8 micron filter. Then after the filtration, we did 100,000G spin to isolate our vesicles. Then afterwards, we actually subjected them to sucrose gradient and then protein powder to show that we can actually label them quite effectively. And this is something 
we saw. So for the Western, you can see that for expression three to five, we have the presence of homotopy GFP, which shows you that you know the homotopy GFP wiggles the vesicles quite well. And this is actually corroborated by the presence of AWIX, which is an uh, exosomal marker. So that's for palm GFP. How about palm PD tomato? We found exactly the same thing that palm PD tomato again labels three, four, and five, and then in the presence of the AVIX protein, showing you that palm PD tomato do label the vesicles as well. So let's put them to test. But before that, we face a question because we once claimed that this labeling actually goes into the inner leaflet of the vesicles. So as you can see, we did PEM. So this is with collaboration, as well as the previous EM image, we did a collaboration with uh, Maria Erickson from Harvard Medical School Conventional EM Center. That you can see for the left, we have the vesicles labeled with NTGFP, basically labeling for the palm GFP. And you can see that most of them, or most of them you can see are on the membrane. And similarly are the same for the TD tomato. That once we uh, immunolabel them, with uh, NTP tomato antibody, most of the signals are on the membrane of the vesicles. Now the question comes is that this is still not specific enough to tell us that it's actually in the re inner leaflet because some of them may suggest them to be on the outside, uh, unfortunately based on the image. So we decided to do a simple but very effective way of deciphering whether this is on the inner or the outer leaflet. So as you can see, what we did is right here. On the left is palm G GFP experiment. On the right is a palm TD tomato vesicle experiment. What we did is that we actually immunoblotted the vesicles. So we immunoblot them onto nitrocellulose the membrane. And then at different concentrations from 5,000 nanogram all the way to 39 nanogram in a gradient fashion. And then we immunoprobe them with NTGFP in the presence or the absence of the detergent. What this may allow us to do is that if the protein that we're labeling with is inside the membrane. You should not be able to label them in the absence of detergent because detergent actually breaks up the membrane. Yet, in the presence of detergent, because the membrane has been broken up, the antibody will be able to enter into the inner leaflet of the vesicle and thereby label your protein of interest. And this is exactly what we saw. We saw that all or most of the signal from uh, NTGFP is actually only after the addition of the detergent. And basically we found the same thing for the homotopated TD tomato vesicles. Now some may ask why we care so much about the uh, inner leaf flow labeling. It's such that we're concerned that it may actually affect the tropism of the vesicle if you actually continuously label the outside of the vesicles. We decided to try the strategy such that we label the inside but not the outside. So in this way, uh, we're trying to minimize um, the effect of additional protein presented on the vesicle membrane. So next, we actually went to test if we can actually do life cell imaging and see if vesicles can actually do, uh, get exchanged between different cellular populations. Uh, because if you look at a lot of previous uh, pioneering works, a lot of them actually, not intensive, intentionally, but they almost make it sound like vesicles actually are unidirectional, but we know that that's not the case uh, back in our mind. So we'd like to see if this is actually a multi-directional uh, exchange of the vesicles as to how the cells actually communicate with one another. So we did a proof of principle study such that we have our 293T cells labeled with palm PD tomato, and then we also have our GBN 20 slide 3 which is uh, expressing palm GFP, and we co-cultured them and did live cell imaging. And what we saw was interesting is that if you look at this enlarged image right here, we see that a lot of vesicle-like structures are actually at the tip of these uh, processes-like protrusions. And very coincidentally, a recent publication actually shows that this may be something what they call microsomes, where the cells, uh, as they migrate, they didn't have enough time to retract their processes and left behind or release vesicles um, during this migration process. So this is actually quite interesting. Uh, we did not know that there is such a thing called microsomes, but later on this may be something exactly like what they reported. Now for the second row right here, we're trying to show that, again, you can see the vesicles um, actually, which is green in this case, actually goes into the red cells. 
and then vice versa, such that the red vesicles actually go into the, uh, the green cells. Telling us that the vesicles actually do get transferred multi-directionally, it's not unidirectional. So if you consider a tissue, the vesicle mediated communication is actually multi-directional, and this is actually quite dramatic in terms of our understanding um, in intercellular communications. Now, while this is not enough, we would like to see if we can actually do time-lapse imaging. So again, this is to show you, again, this is um, Z-stack confocal image, which is uh, with a live cell, that you can actually see a lot of the vesicles. So what we did right here is that we isolated homotology P tomato EV, and then we treated them onto homotology P expressing cells, 293T cells in this case. And you can see a lot of the vesicles around the periphery of the 293T cells ready to dot, or in the periphery of it. So what do we see if we can actually do time-lapse imaging on this? So this is an exemplary image right here, which later I will ask uh, our moderator to play. So, but before that, allow me to show you that at this point, as well at this point, you can already see that there are red like vesicles that's been actually either attached or involved by the recipient cells. And more interestingly, if you look at this blank space right here, you will see that there may be something like an oncosome because the, there will be a, quite a big vesicle coming out from this area. So, Don, could you please play the movie and then let us see what the movie looks like? Thank you, Don. So this is quite dramatic because if you look at it, this has been taken for over 10 minutes. And if you have done, or if you're doing high resolution imaging, you know that usually they will get photo bleach quite quickly. But in this case, I barely have to adjust the photo laser power. So we are quite surprised by that, that uh, it's actually quite resistant to photo bleaching effect. We don't exactly know the reason as to why that is, but we are speculating maybe one is that the vesicles or the palmitolated GFP or TD tomato are inside the vesicle and that may actually allow them to escape um, photooxidation because there may not be as much um, oxygen available for uh, photo bleaching to occur. But again, that's only a speculation. Regardless, this shows us that this tool is actually very effective for long-term time-lapse imaging at subcellular resolution. So we decided to go on one step further is to see if we can actually see them in vivo. So we actively collaborate with Dr. To uh, Dr. Tosa Mempo from NGH and Harvard Medical School, such that we did a model right here. As you can see, uh, what we did is, again, let me pull out some pointers. So we have uh, our CPT7 black mouse, and then we have EL4 thymoma, stably expressing palmitoid GFP. Then we first installed a dorsal skin full chamber, which is on right here. Then we actually inject these uh, cells into the chamber. Then after nine days, we did multi-photon intravivo, uh, so intravital microscopy. And this is something that we'll see with these movies right here. So this movie right here will show you what has been imaged right here. And it's really dramatic. So Don, could you please play the next movie? So as you just saw, a lot of vesicles are being released by all of these cells. And then this is actually inside the animal life. So this is really quite dramatic. Then we decided to actually look at higher resolution. So if you focus on this one, which is something that you will see in this movie to be played very soon. So Don, could you please the next movie, please? Thank you, Don. So this is a, it's like you can see the vesicles being released by the cells inside the animals. 
this really tells us that this is happening inside a live animal and no longer just an imagination. Now, the other thing is that what happens if you look at the extracellular space? This is something that we are very stunned as to how fast the vesicles are being released and trafficked inside a tumor region. So, Don, could you please the next movie for this one? That was a little bit fast, but you can see that some of the vesicles actually travel in clusters instead of just uh, single vesicles that you can see right here, which I'll point to right now. So these are single ones, but inside the movie, you can see that some of them actually travel in clusters in the circle that we actually uh, depicted inside the movie. So this is really quite amazing, but um, I know the movie played a little bit quite quickly, but if you look a little bit close to the time, those movies are actually for half an hour. So the fact that the reporter can actually last such a long uh, imaging session tells us that this reporter is actually quite useful for long-term in vivo study and also for in vitro studies for us to track um, these vesicles. Now, we have witnessed them. We know that they are actually being released by the cells. We know that it's multidirectional. We know that they actually exist in vivo. What's next? Do they actually actively deliver their cargo? That's something that we really would like to see. So a lot of really good work has been shown that vesicles actually carry microRNA and mRNA, but we really like to visualize them. So what we did right here is actually to devise um, a two-parts reporter. So what we did here is, as you can see on the left, we have our vesicle RNA reporter. So as you can see, we have, again, palmitoidal PD tomato. So what this allows to do is to label our donor cells and subsequently the vesicles is isolated with red. But at the three prime uh, untranslated region, three prime UPR, we actually pack them with MS2 binding sites, 24 repeats. What allows us to do is that we would have the transcripts, which in this case shown in blue, like this, and then we co-express them with another reporter. So again, the transcript is in blue, which is something that you can see right here. And then we have a second part of the reporter, which is the uh, RNA reporter. This, we have the MS2 coprotein. So what this coprotein allows to do is that it will bind to the MS2 binding sites. And then, again, the coprotein is actually conjugated to GFP. So you have MS2CP, the coprotein GFP. What will happen is like this. So if you look on the right, typically the coprotein, which will recognize the MS24 tag, if they don't recognize it, they will actually go to a nucleus because we have a nuclear localization signal following the GFP. So that's when they don't actually bind to the transcript. But once it's bound to the transcript, which is located right here, we expect them to actually be recruited by random chance. And then by random chance, they'll be released either through direct budding or by release through the multiplexicular body. And then we will have vesicles that first of them, they'll be red. But if they do have mRNA, then they will be shown in green because we have the coprotein bound to these mRNA. And this is actually exactly what we saw. We saw that in our experimental condition, we have MS2 coprotein GFP co-expressed with palmitoidic tomato with MS24 times. So we have the cells co-expressing these. We isolate the vesicles and then we look at them. And we can actually see key tomato quite well because that's for the vesicles. But not only that, within these vesicles, we actually see the green signal, which signifies the presence of the mRNA package within these vesicles. In contrast, if we actually remove MS24 RNA binding sites, we actually don't see the green signal at all. This basically tells us that the mRNA do get packaged. Even on the membrane within, we do see them um, on the vesicles. Then the next question is, okay, we can visualize the transcripts, but do they actually carry a role? Can they actually be translated? And that's and a question that we decide to challenge. So what we did is to actually understand how fast do the mRNA be delivered by the vesicles gets translated once they actually been received by the receiving cells. So what we did right here is actually we multiplex the reporters that we have actually gone over 
in the past few slides. So what we did right here, again, is actually by using common toilet GFP construct, which you can see on the left. So what this allows to do is we'll label our donor cells as well as our recipient, oh, sorry, as well, as well as our vesicles green. Then we actually use GLOOP B, which is something that we discussed earlier. What we're really interested in here is actually its transcript. So again, remember that GLOOP B is extremely sensitive. So we would have our product of the vesicle, we will have green vesicle with GLOOP B protein on the, mem on the membrane outside, but we would also have the transcript of the GLOOP B within it. Then we took these vesicles and then we treated them onto our recipient cells, which is Gly36 GBM, uh, stably expressing m -cherry. So when this happens, once we treat it onto them, you can actually see that the green vesicles be taken up by the red cells. So this allows us to do a few things. So one thing is that we can actually see the vesicle uptake by for, uh, flow cytometry analysis, so by fax analysis, such that if you have vesicle uptake, you will detect both the green and the red signal. But if you only have the cells alone, you only have the red. But in addition to that, we can actually do vesicle mRNA translation assay uh, that you can see on the right. So basically over time, if we actually start to see an increase in the bioluminescence, that would signify that the, uh, the mRNA are being actively translated by the recipient cells. And this is actually how the experiment schedule looks. So what we did is we have the vesicles, and then we actually treated them by using uh, something similar to spin fashion, essentially. We centrifuge the, ves uh, the vesicles onto the recipient cells at 4 degrees Celsius. So what this allows to do is that the vesicles will dock onto the cells without being internalized because they are at 4 degrees Celsius. Then after that, after an hour and a half, we resume the temperature, the temperature to 37 degrees Celsius, and then we replace the media uh, to rid of uh, any excess vesicles that have not, have, has not been bound. And then we have the media uh, supplemented with or without cyclohexamine, which is uh, cyclohexamine is uh, translation inhibitor. And then we started collecting the samples at different time points from zero hour all the way to 24 hours. And then throughout all of these time points, we assay for, again, something we mentioned, two things. One is the vesicle uptake, and the second thing is the vesicle mRNA translation. And this is what we saw. So again, on the left right here is a reminder of how our schedule looks. And on the right, top right right here, we can see vesicle do get uptake quite readily. So again, this is minus 1.5 hour when the uh, skin fashion just begun, so there is no vesicle uptake at all or docking. But after one and a half hour of uh, skin infection, then yeah, you can see the vesicles are being docked, or around 5 to 10 percent of the cells have the vesicles docked on the membrane, and then you start to see the signal going up to around 3 hour, followed by a decline to 12 hour, then a plateau between 12 to 24 hours. What happens if we look at the translation then is that it's remarkable that if you look at the translation pattern, now, sorry, something I forgot to mention is the red line is the one without cyclohexamide, and the blue line is the one with cyclohexamide. And then if we look at the bottom, the EVRNA translation, you can see that soon after vesicle docking or uptake, within one hour, which is the red line right here, without cyclohexamide, the bioluminescence signal is already going up. And this goes all the way up to 12 hour, followed by a plateau from 12 hour to 24 hour, which coincides with the uptake pattern that we see right here on the top. And then in contrast, if we actually add the translation inhibitor, then we actually see um, this translation event suppressed throughout um, the period of this experiment. So this tells us that the vesicle deliver RNA do get translated quite readily. Uh, especially within an hour after its uptake. And not only that, we took one step further, we did uh, nascent protein synthesis assay to ensure that our cyclohexamide treatment do successfully suppress translational event. And as you can see right here, once we add cyclohexamide, which is showing blue, that the uh, translation level basically is down to the very bottom. And then in, without cyclohexamide, you do still see a background level of translational going on. And this is shown by clicked HPG labeling, which is something very similar to the radioactive um, methylene labeling technique, but 
this one is a little bit safer where you don't need to play with the radioactive materials. So with these, we actually show a lot of stuff that classical transfer as well as classical mediated communication is very dynamic and multi-directional. And the next step that we're interested in doing is to see how tumor vesicles are being distributed inside the animal uh, by using the uh, reporter techniques that we developed. So first we'd like to identify the vesicle receiving cells from the tumors and, doing, and then we would like to do them by both in vitro and also in vivo. And not only that, as you have seen, we can use both the fluorescence as well as the bioluminescence um, methods to allow us to do a certain level of semi-quantification uh, where we don't have to rely on techniques such as uh, NPA, nanocyte, or other um, techniques such as uh, the Q nano. And not only that, we like to try to use these vesicles for imaging as well as for gene therapy, where you saw the imaging, but the next step that we like to take is to actually use them for therapy. And it's really important, as most of you will know, that most of the vesicle, or at least in the liposome field, they actually do get degraded quite fast through uh, endosomal lysosomal degradation. So we're very interested in tracking and seeing how effective the vesicles are delivered to their recipient cells and whether they can actually escape uh, the degradation pathways. Now, just to mention something about um, a collaboration that's also ongoing by using this technique is that we're actively collaborating with Dr. Shannon Scott um, that we're developing microfluidics chips to capture uh, GBM vesicles. And this is a very exciting project that we're hoping to see publication in this year. And then what allows us to do basically is that just by using the patient's blood or serum, we can actually run through a microfluidic chip, capture the vesicles that's specific to the GBMs, and then we can do the downstream analysis through either G qPCR or next gen sequencing, and thereby allows us to see, allows us to, to see a pattern of GBM patient specific um, signature. And last but not least, I would like to thank a lot of my colleagues from Boston. Or, and this basically is Dr. Sandra Brickfield's lab. As you can see, this is my mentor right in the center. And also on to my uh, right right here would be Dr. Bartos Tanus. They have been very, very uh, helpful, and they're just great mentors. I really thank them as well as all of the team. This is Dr. Casey McGuire, which are also very supportive in the early parts of the study. And uh, this is just acknowledgement slides to show, I hope that plays well, yep, that uh, many, many people to thank, that uh, we have a very good team back in Boston uh, from Dr. Sandra Bayfield's lab, as well as from Dr. Tanuk's uh, lab. And also the uh, in vivo imaging that you saw, very elegant study, but with Dr. Tosin Menkel's group, and as well as the really, really, really beautiful uh, EM images with um, Maria Erickson from HEMS uh, Conventional EM Core. And also we collaborate very closely with uh, Dr. Ralph Weisseder, Shannon Star, as I mentioned earlier, and Casey McGuire, Dr. Johann Scott from Exos Diagnostic on these studies. And last but not least, we'd like to thank all of our uh, funding sponsors uh, from NIH, as well as my um, fellowship during my PDF years, uh, postdoctoral fellow years from uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research. So, with that, I'd just like to uh, promote our school in National Tsinghua University. We have a very strong team of biomedical engineers that work on a variety of um, fields, such as uh, biomaterials, biosensors, drug delivery, molecular imaging, and even cell power nanosystems. So as you can see right here, this is the one created by one of our um, professors that they can actually test urine. Um, a lot of the uh, biomarkers, they can actually test just by using a test tape which is something really cool. And we are, we're also developing some fiber-based nanogenerators where you can actually generate electricity uh, just based on your movement. So we're a very dynamic group that we highly encourage people to check it out if you're interested. And here are the keywords. If you type in NPHU and BME, you can find us. And uh, then we'll also put on the link uh, to these. And for the movies, if you'd like to look at them more specifically, uh, they have also been published. So Don will also have the links to them that you can put it up. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions that um, you would like to ask, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Great. 
Thanks for that uh, highly informative presentation, Dr. Lai. Uh, before we get started on the question and answer session, I would again like to remind our audience that you can submit questions uh, by typing them in the Q&A box. Uh, you'll find that at the lower left of the presentation window. Uh, we've already had several good questions uh, come in from our audience, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first question is, have you ever tested labeled exosomes from different donors, like mouse-derived cell lines? Do you expect that they would have different target organs? Hmm, that's a very good question. Thank you. So we have not tested um, direct comparison between the different source of the exosomes. Um, so basically, short answer for that would be no, we have not tested them, but we do expect them to carry different um, tropism, basically. I believe that's what you're asking. So we do anticipate that there are different tropism, but we did not test it. So that's something that could be tested, or if you're interested, we're open to collaboration for that. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that answer. Uh, our second question is, have you determined the average size of the EVs before injection in mice? Thank you. So for this one, we did use the nanocyte system to test. So since we actually, sorry, I mentioned a little bit quickly, we did filter them through a 0.22 micron for that study. So the average size we saw lands somewhere around, if I remember correctly, sorry, it is inside our publication that we do have a nano size, um, size distribution. It is somewhere around 150 range. So we did determine the average size to the vesicles prior to the injection into the mice. And something interesting is that we do actually anticipate, so this relates back to the earlier question, not only do the different donor uh, vesicle might affect the tropism, but the size may actually affect its tropism because this is what exactly they saw in the liposome field. So that would be something interesting to test. So again, we'll be happy to work with you if you're interested in that. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, next question coming in is uh, whether or not you checked the health of the cells uh, producing the fluorescent vesicles. Hi, that's a good question. So have we checked the cell, the health of the cells putting the fluorescent vesicle? We do know that they definitely grow slower than the one their counterparts, they basically their control. Now that's expected because you're putting on reporters onto their membranes. So we do know that, especially when it's an um, overexpression system, even though it is a stable expression system, uh, we definitely did see a slower growth. How healthy are they? In our case, they we actually generate stable lines, so we actually can repeatedly use them without having to, you know, transpect again and again. And by using stable infection, this actually allows us to um, avoid the possible artifact from accidental tra uh, transfer of the plasmids. So by doing this, um, again, the health is definitely not as healthy as uh, the non transpect or non stably expressing cells. But then again, all of the models that we're testing right here are actually cancer cells. So it's kind of hard to define what is healthy, considering that they're already pretty um, non-normal. So yes, it does carry a burden on them. But I think that's expected with every type of reporter system. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one last question uh, is, wh why, you, why do you prefer to use centrifugation as opposed to other methods for EV isolation? That's actually a very good question. I, the, the short answer for that is that it is something that we're most accustomed to at that time. Now, we know that there are a lot of other techniques coming out, um, you know, such as, you know, People, a lot of people probably you know ExoQuick as one, even though we don't, we know that it might not be as clean. Uh, other people are using uh, you know beads. Um, those are the things that uh, came out before our time, basically. So we now know that they exist, but when we were developing those tools, um, we didn't, or at least we're not as familiar with 
with those tools. So that's what we didn't try. But I think that's definitely something that we can try and compare because, again, with the tools that we develop, I think it will be interesting to see if that actually affects, um, again, the yield as well as the distribution of the size um, of the vesicles that you isolate. So I think that's something very interesting to be tried. A very good question. Yes, so that's something that we're always wondering when we were, quote unquote, stuck with only one method of uh, isolation. Thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time today. I, I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, and of course, Dr. Char Charles Lai for making today's webinar possible, which will also be available for on-demand viewing through BeckmanCoulter.com. Thanks again. Goodbye.